the flotations are very limited. So when you buy when you buy a share of Coca-Cola, yeah, I mean the way Coca-Cola is, it's, it's a listed company, and it's managed for uh, shareholder value, uh, particularly for common stockholder value. So you can be pretty confident that, that Coca-Cola will manage in a way that will get your share price up. That's not the case when you have a limited float, which is often done in the Gulf. So you can have a company that will float only 20% of its shares. So 80% are held by the, by the founder, 20% are floated. Well, there could be a, no, a lot of reasons why that business owner may not want to uh, create immediate value for the common shareholder. Uh, and, and you as a minority shareholder are sort of left uh, without decision rights in that situation, which, which would be concerning for a lot of investors. Second is a retail dominated market. It's amazing. I mean, if you go to the Abu Dhabi Stock Exchange, that's changing now, but if you, go, if you went there in the height of the boom, it was amazing because you see these guys, you know how when you look at the Chicago Mercantile or something, you see these guys running around with jackets and sort of shouting at each other. Uh, if you go to Abu Dhabi, you find that these are actually not, these aren't brokers. There are people who are acting like that, but they're, they're retail investors uh, who are kind of, you know, buying and selling on the moment, kind of talking to each other, huddling in circles. And, um, and it sort of made it, uh, it's a very retail driven market, which is troubling because sentiment goes up and sentiment goes down and the markets are very volatile, whereas institutional money is considered more stable. Uh, there's very limited corporate debt which means that the sort of ability for, co for companies to raise capital is constrained. Uh, and the last, uh, which is related to the second, is around the sentiment-driven nature of the markets. And the really interesting example of this was the year 2006. Because in the year 2006, we had record oil prices, uh, bigger surpluses than ever before. Corporate earnings in the Gulf were fantastic. And the stock market was down about 75%. Um, and if you look at uh, the, what happened with this current crisis, it's fascinating because, you know, we had a very volatile run here with the New York Stock Exchange, um, but it was more pronounced actually in the GCC. So the GCC lost a greater percentage of value uh, and now is recovering, but it's fundamentally speaking, the earnings of the Gulf companies would be somewhat, of course, related to the oil prices, but as I mentioned, uh, for a lot of the countries, there are still surpluses with low, low oil prices. So there was more of a, just a kind of panic uh, in the market. And we saw a panic here as well, but it was more pronounced in the Gulf. So with that, I'll stop because I'm interested in hearing your questions and comments. But uh, suffice it to say, there's a lot of interesting uh, developments with Gulf Capital and Islamic Finance, and they're, they're having a big impact on how international markets function. Thank you, Amr. We look forward to your book. I'll ask you later, what, there must be debates about moral and immoral investments, but mm -hmm. uh, questions from the audience? Yeah, I, I had a question. I had a question as to the, uh, your take on the severe financial distress in the GCC markets. I mean, two of the private investment companies mm -hmm. you made are trying to restructure yes. substantial amounts mm -hmm. of debt with uh, not a lot of success on the horizon yet. Mm -hmm. Two of the other companies you mentioned have serious problems. Yes. Two of the major sovereign-owned banks in the area uh, have been forced to dramatically change their business models. Mm -hmm. You have the, the collapse of real estate. Yeah. And then you have this $20 billion of Saad and Al Ghasabi uh -huh. floating around with maybe six banks holding 30% of it. Right. How does that all fit into your scenario? Well, you know, I think it, so certainly, uh, I mean, a few points on that. So one is that the real estate exposure of the banks is a very serious issue. And that's, but that is more pronounced in Dubai than anywhere else. Uh, so you see that in, Dub in Dubai as a very, a very big issue. Um, uh, less so elsewhere in the Gulf. What you'll see is a, is a, is a consolidation there which is important and good. I mean, the, the UAE has 45 or so banks, which is too many for, uh, for uh, you know, they have half the population of New York City and they have 45 banks, not branches, but, but banks. Uh, so they need, to, they need to sort that out. So I think this will be sort of an important shakeout for them. On the government side, uh, when you talk about the banks, you, do you mean uh, a, a Gulf Investment, uh, Gulf or uh, what is it? GIB, GIB Gulf Investment Bank. GIB is one, and what's the other one you thought about? 
ABC. So ABC is an interesting one. ABC is sort of, it, is, it was funded by the government, but it's been operating very independently, sort of quasi uh, private. GIB is a big issue. So GIB made uh, some, some uh, mistakes on their treasury investment. Yeah, to put it mildly. Um, and I think, I think, you know, what I'm hoping to see is that there should be a shakeout and the weaker and the more poorly governed institutions should, uh, should um, fall out uh, or be forced to consolidate. And uh, I hope that's what happens. And now in Kuwait, I'm sure you're following, there's a lot of pressure, or there was a lot of pressure on the government to bail out all sorts of institutions. And I think if they do so, it's, it's not going to be good for the markets in the long run. So I see this as part of the maturing process, uh, and uh, it's, it's overdue. Hi. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you state your name and affiliation? Sure. David Johnson, Drill Solutions. Um, I'm wondering what your take on finance as a mechanism of foreign policy, like sanctions, mm -hmm. or um, if HSBC makes strategic choices to do business with certain countries or companies, mm. um, like Iraq, for example, mm. um, being a definitely emerging market, mm. but high risk. Yeah. Thank you. Well, of the, the, the first one, the, I think the second part of the question is a bit more straightforward. So for the, you know, for the global institutions that I know, for example, HSBC, it's a very, um, it's a very economic, it's a shareholder driven uh, discussion. Obviously, the, there are guidelines around uh, compliance and legal, so we don't, we didn't touch Iran, although perhaps there might have been good deals there, but that's because from a regulatory perspective, you couldn't go there. But there was certainly no political agenda. I mean, the HSBC is a British bank, but you know, owned by pen, sort of big funds in, South, in um, Hong Kong, the UK, and elsewhere. So there's, uh, that wasn't a factor for, for the institutions that I have. Sanctions? Um, sort of Iran, mm -hmm. or, um, you know, they, I, I guess that would be the laws that are yeah. associated to the choices that are made. But yeah. It, like, 2006, mm -hmm. when Iraq was going through very serious difficulties. Yeah. And that's when the oil price was high. So we're talking about positive economic circumstances for right. some people right. and very right. risky and dangerous circumstances for others. Right. How does that play into... You know, yeah. No, I mean, a lot of it, so there's, as you're alluding to, there's risk-reward scenarios there. And a lot of times, you know, within the region, for example, if you look at Lebanon, you know, uh, the, the, the Gulf feels like it understands Lebanon better than a lot of people understand Lebanon, right? Because it's closer, a lot of them vacation there, et cetera. So the private investors will be more inclined to go in. Now, the, the sovereigns, of course, will operate by the government policies as well. So they'll be concerned about, uh, you know, investing in the market. They wouldn't invest in Iran, for example, no matter how good the return is, because that's not the policy of the government and they, that would not be allowed. So that, that's how it works. But on the private side, it depends very much family to family, but, they, but when they understand the risk, they see an opportunity that other people don't, don't have. One last question, please. Hi there. Thanks for your talk. Yeah. Very interesting. Um, I'm curious on the issue of Islamic finance uh -huh. and customer pressure, yeah. consumer pressure. Uh -huh. um, so you worked for HBC uh -huh. and you were doing Islamic finance uh -huh. for HBC. How much did you see customers not willing to work with that branch of HBC? Because ultimately, mm -hmm. the profits go to HBC. H this is always an issue, of right. course. Where do you end the chain? Mm -hmm. But um, how much was there fallout, or not at all, from people who were ultimately saying, well, HBC is making investments that don't accord with my view of Sharia? Yeah. No, so I mean, certainly there was some, there's a segment of the market that will, uh, there were some that wouldn't even deal with HSBC because, uh, as you said, parts of the business are not, you know, the bulk of the business is not Sharia compliant. So the idea was they didn't want to kind of interact with that bank at all. Another issue, of course, <coughs> behind that is that what's called the commingling of funds. So you put an Islamic deposit in, we can't guarantee that it would necess your dollar will be used for an Islamic loan. So those, those issues were there. So it actually, for the multinationals, this is one of their disadvantages. So they lose out on a certain portion of the market. But what we found is the most uh, kind of lucrative part of the market, so the higher net worth individuals uh, and the more professional workers, they were more open to interacting with a conventional bank if they had an Islamic window, as long as the products and services themselves were Sharia compliant. So it was it basically there's some customers that will only go to an Islamic bank, a fully Islamic bank, but a lot of customers, especially a lot of the, the, the kind of attractive ones, will go to a multinational. Very interesting. Well, if there are any more questions, uh, come up to Amr afterwards. Thank you all so much. <laughs> Thank you.
Raoul is not.